This is Focus on Your Health. It's brought to you by Kingman Regional Medical Center in historic Kingman, Arizona. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and this week I'm coming to you from KRMC's Disease Management Clinic. We are talking all about hepatitis, in particular hepatitis C. It is a contagious disease and inflammation of the liver. We'll get a proper definition, and we'll talk with our guests here. We have a bunch of them. I want to welcome everybody. Uh, Dr. Linda Williams, she is a doctor of pharmacy, and she is the pharmacy manager here at KRMC. Dr. Williams, welcome back. Thank you so much. It's great to be here today. It is great to visit with you. I always enjoy my trips to the uh, disease management clinic, so thank you. Uh, also, Dr. Lily Huang, she is a doctor of pharmacy. Dr. Huang, welcome. Nice to be on the show today. Thank you. Also, Dr. Katie Halza, she's another doctor of pharmacy. Hi, Dr. Halza. Hi, thanks for having us. Thank you. Also joining us is Kristen Nelson Rowan. She is an RN and the care coordinator here. Hi, Kristen, welcome. Hi, thanks for having us. <laughs> All right, so to begin with, we should start with a, a definition, a proper definition of hepatitis. And who drew the short straw on that one? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so hepatitis C is, um, as you mentioned, it's a, a contagious infection that uh, lives in your liver, the virus. Um, resides mostly in the liver, it also circulates around in your blood. So uh, we specifically look for hepatitis C and its effects on your liver. And it's contagious. How is this virus spread? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's spread through contact with the blood mainly. So we uh, generally think about it circulating around. So if uh, blood is on surfaces or direct uh, from person to person, that's how you could potentially get it. So uh, we think about it in, in several ways. Uh, you know, it can live on surfaces for several weeks. So you don't necessarily have to see the blood on the surface um, in order to come in contact with it. I wouldn't want listeners to be overly worried about blood on surfaces. We really wanna focus on those higher risk patients and high risk activities. Dr. Wong, what are some of the most common manners in which the disease is spread? You know, the way that patient can contract hepatitis C is can be, again, like Dr. Hausa say, through blood. Um, so some example is if you have a person in your household that have um, untreated hepatitis C, unawareness, and if they have a cut or a sore and that blood is contracted with, you know, other member in the household, they can contract it with um, hepatitis C. Now, our immune system is really smart. And, you know, eventually we can uh, clear the hepatitis C um, with our immune system. But some cases, if the patient is getting older, fat veins have other um, disease day, um, their liver is not really healthy. That is when, you know, hepatitis C can start to um, overreacting and a patient can show up to have hepatitis C. Dr. Halsa, some patient populations are more vulnerable to hep C, though. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so some of our uh, patients that we look at that are potentially more high risk for contracting hepatitis C. Um, so we, we recommend uh, getting screened for patients that um, have any sort of IV drug exposure. It can live in those syringes for a long time um, as well, if, especially if there's any sharing of needles. Uh, we also recommend screening for other um, like drugs that are uh, taken through the nose as well, because those blood vessels are pretty easy to break. Yeah, I, I do want to back up on that and emphasize, although with hepatitis C, it has, when we think about it, we may think of okay, IV drug users, we may think of tattoos in unlicensed facilities. Just because there are certain populations that may be tied more so to hepatitis C, there are a multitude of ways that a patient can contract it. And that's why we recommend, based on the guidelines, we recommend screening of everyone 18 and over. Well, part of that is also, uh, as I understand, trying to uh, reduce some of the stigma attached with having hepatitis C. Is that correct? Yes. So we have even had patients who were uh, maintenance workers in casinos and going into those rooms in the casinos, getting scratched um, and having open wounds. And you can't see the visible blood. And so we've had casino workers, even people who rendered aid to a co-worker who didn't know that they had hepatitis C, had some blood transfer and had 
contracted hepatitis C that way. So even those who have never been incarcerated, never did IV drug use, or those tattoos, they are contracting hepatitis C. Also, a higher risk population is those who have received a blood transfusion prior to the 90s or organ transplants. And so we've had some who in their uh, childhood years had a blood transfusion 40 years ago and now have hepatitis C. How did the quality control standards change from the 90s to now where that's not an issue anymore? So hepatitis C uh, wasn't even identified as a disease um, until that point in time. So they weren't screening the blood that was donated um, or any sort of organs that were um, transplanted until the 90s. So that's why, you know, we didn't know about it until, until the 90s. So anybody that got it prior to that, it wouldn't have been looked at. Kristen, you mentioned some of the um, sort of involuntary and roundabout ways people can get exposed. I know also among first responders and medical workers, they can get exposures too. Yes, using gloves in the medical setting didn't become popular until the 90s as well. And so trying to screen everybody who was police, fire, EMS, any hospital worker, Uh, is going to be important for us to be able to catch those cases that were before we had the awareness of hepatitis C. Another place that we have seen an uptick is from those who have had uh, surgical procedures or uh, medical in Mexico or other countries that didn't have as clean or sterilized equipment. Well, this is such a polite show, and I appreciate that, but I think we've sort of sidestepped the the fact that a lot of it is also sexually transmitted. Should we talk about that? Yeah, so if it's okay, I'm just going to take a step back. Hepatitis C, we've typically seen it in this baby boomer population, but we're also seeing this uptick in that uh, 20 to 39 year old population. And that is one one reason for that is because of the IV drug use. But we also do not want to forget about the population, specifically men having sex with men. So we are now seeing a bimodal curve. And what that means is there is a bump in this younger population. And an interesting part of that is we are seeing an increase in females getting hepatitis C. And what that means is there's something called vertical transmission. So if a woman becomes pregnant, she can pass that on to her child uh, during uh, during the pregnancy. That's a whole nother topic. Yeah, well, what is the likelihood of that? It's about 5%. We can now treat children as young as three years of age. So if you are a pregnant woman or had a child and you you are hepatitis C positive, we do recommend that your children get tested as well because we can treat them very easily after the age of three. Dr. Wong, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, we just want to mention that the treatment for hepatitis C medication is not recommended during pregnancy. So, you know, if the if the um, the mom have hepatitis C, we would rather to wait until she finished with her pregnancy and after even with breastfeeding that we can start a treatment um, for the children. We um, started to screening and monitor closely. I know that our focus today is hepatitis C. There are other types of hepatitis. And they're more common, less worrisome. Can we get sort of a brief overview of those? Sure. So there's uh, both hepatitis A and hepatitis B, as well as hepatitis C. There's also a hepatitis D that um, we focus less on as far as like screening goes, because it tends to kind of just be wrapped into hepatitis B. So the hepatitis A and B, um, hepatitis A can be cleared on its own. Hepatitis B can also be living in your system um, without, um, you know, any noticeable symptoms similarly. Um, So we tend to always screen uh, our hepatitis C patients for both A and B as well to make sure that they don't have both infections at the same time. Hepatitis C is the one, is it safe to say, that causes the greatest health challenges to us or that poses the greatest risk? Well, what we want to do is when we think about hepatitis A, B, and C, hepatitis C does not have a vaccination. Hepatitis A and B have a vaccination 
that is available. And when someone has hepatitis C, they may not even know because by the times that symptoms are showing or um, start becoming obvious, the patient may have been living with that for a long time. And what ends up happening is that although it may take a long time for symptoms to show up, it could eventually progress to liver damage, scarring of the liver, liver cancer, and unfortunately, including death. So as you alluded to, signs and symptoms, we want to talk about signs and symptoms, and in many cases, there are no visible symptoms. Is that correct? Yes. So um, in majority of our um, younger patients, um, they don't seem to have a lot of symptoms, um, but symptoms can be fatigue, loss of appetite, pain in their abdomens. Um, they can have yellow skin, yellow eyes, we call it jaundice. Um, they can have easier with bruising, um, harder to stop the bleedings, um, you know, and other, other symptoms that could have um, as well. And, and despite the fact that the symptoms aren't visible in those populations, the damage is still taking place. Yeah, so oftentimes the more severe symptoms that we think about, which would be like swelling of the stomach or um, bleeding, um, you know, from your, um, like either in your stools or, or vomiting blood, that those more severe symptoms seem like they happen once the liver damage is much more advanced. So those symptoms that like Dr. Huang mentioned, you know, they could those could be caused from a variety of things. They're kind of general, right? So we kind of think of those general symptoms being when the liver is a little bit less damaged, and then um, you know that damage can progress, um, you know, without you having super specific symptoms. If you're just joining us, this is Focus on Your Health. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and this week I'm coming to you from KRMC's Disease Management Clinic. We're talking all about hepatitis C in our community and treating it. Kristen, why the renewed focus or why the new focus on treating hepatitis C here in Mojave County? In May, it is Hepatitis C Testing and Awareness Day, and we are really ramping up our focus here in the community, we have expanded to non-KRMC providers as well to be able to receive those referrals from. And TG, you mentioned a good point. Why even focus on this? Well, in our partnership with the Arizona Department of Public Health, we've been given information that really shows why this is a serious issue for our community and in our county. With information that we've received, Mojave County has the highest incidence of hepatitis C in the entire state. We are considered the top 5% of counties in the U.S. for a hepatitis C, uh, as vulnerable for a hepatitis C outbreak. I, I know that, you know, when we talk about public health, we try to parse through that information and figure out this, the trends, the signs and symptoms. Um, it's such a complicated and interesting field, right? So without casting judgment, is it, why do we think or why would it be that we're so vulnerable here in the county? Yes, there's a multitude of areas. The score is assessed based on our prescribing practices as well as the opioid and IV drug use abuse in this area, as well as the HIV infection rates. Those are the major points here in our county. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk a bit about treatment. We've kind of painted the picture that this is a, a serious and dangerous, and yet treatment is pretty reliable, or, or let, let's talk about treatment a bit. Yeah, the treatment is has come a long way in the last um, 20 years. So the treatment now, it's like once a day pill that um, is oral. Um, it's no longer an injection. Um, it's no longer uh, quite as long of a treatment. So usually most people can get treated in two to three months um, and be completely cured. So the cure rate for those medications that we use most commonly is 96% now. So um, much, much higher than what it was in the past as well. So if you take the medication every day and, uh, you know, without fail, then you have a really, really high chance of being cured. Two to three months of one pill per day. So one of the medications is three pills once a day. You take them all at the same time. Okay. And then the other medication that we use most commonly is one pill once a day. Right. With the same results, basically. Yeah. They have about the same chance of that 96% cure. And what about the uh, affordability, the prices for these treatments? Yeah. Kristen's our expert on that. Yeah, please. <laughs> so both medications are actually quite pricey. So the treatment that is 
two months is about $30,000, and the three-month treatment is $90,000, which is a lot for our community, which is a lot for anybody in Arizona. Sure. So we do have about 65% of our population is Medicaid or Access, and so their treatment is totally free. They don't have to pay for their labs or their medications, so that makes it super easy. For those of our Medicare patients, which is about 28, uh, 30%, it can be very pricey, especially with the coverage gaps of Medicare and the donut holes a lot of patients talk about. And so we utilize uh, patient assistance programs and grant funding applications. And so far, all of our patients have paid less than $18 a month. Our average copay is zero to five dollars a month for two to three months and so everybody has been able to afford the small amount that that's their responsibility that's amazing yeah that uh and so i'm kind of reading the subtext here and i feel like because you began by saying how expensive the medications are and then the the availability of the medications and the grants so it has to be another public health measure where we're seeing how much more affordable it is to treat the virus than to treat people who are dying from the virus. Right. It definitely, once those patients have hit that liver disease and they're being hospitalized for the swelling of their abdomen or the gastrointestinal bleeding or the confusion, it can cost them fifty to $100,000 annually for their medical treatment. If they get cured for $5 a month, Yeah then there's not that cost on the system. There's not that burden on patients to go into the hospital for that if we're able to treat them before that significant damage happens. Dr. Williams, I know we're just kind of getting underway with this effort to reach out to the community. Is is that correct? Yes, that is. That is a newer initiative that we kicked off in early 2021. How is it going so far? It is fantastic. And what I love that we were able to highlight with today is we have put together a very effective team along with streamlined processes. What we've heard from Kristen is that there are barriers and one of those barriers is financial along with the multiple barriers that are in place from the payers. And what that means is there's a lot of behind the scenes work that needs to happen in terms of documentation, collaboration between the different healthcare team members and our clinic. So we make sure once we're involved, we make it as easy and simple on the patient as possible. Do you have any idea how many people have gone through the program or have been treated so far? We officially have 39 cures as of this week. Wow. And we are having a couple of others get their labs done. So we should be hitting that 40 to 50 pretty soon. And have you had some who began and didn't didn't see it through? Because you were saying you have to take the medicine every day. And, right? Yes. So we do have a population because of the high risk. A lot of our, our patients, they have phone problems. Uh, they move around a lot. We do have a transient population. Yeah. And so it's harder to keep track of them but the number that has um, that we have lost the follow-up is a lot smaller only about um, five to ten total patients yeah well it may be premature to say congratulations but it sounds like you're making real progress and that's that's exciting yeah it is absolutely exciting how can How can we verbalize how amazing it is to actually cure a disease, to bring care and treatment into our community, to cure a disease for our community? Um, It's it's unbelievable. Yeah, we have a little celebration each time during our last visit with people. We send them a certificate um, to let them know they're cured. So, you know, it's it's always a happy um, last visit with those patients. And one thing that I have, that I share all the time, being a nurse, I've been in the healthcare field for almost 20 years, and for the first time in my career that I am helping cure disease, that we are taking a problem off of your list. And that is something that, you know, we aren't able to do with diabetes. You're always going to be it's diabetic. It's about diabetic. management, right? That's management. Yeah. Same thing with our anticoagulation coagulants is it's about management. It's about which medication are you going to be on for life. 
with hepatitis C. We're curing. You're done. We say goodbye. We high five. And we look for our next opportunity to cure another person because every patient cured in Kingman is making a difference in our community. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, Dr. Wong, I wanted to ask, we talked about some of the vulnerable populations. Uh, Who needs to get tested? I would say right now with the guideline and the bimodals um, curve that we have seen so far, not only the baby boomer having hepatitis C, but also the younger adults uh, within 20 to 35 years old um, studying having more cases too. We recommend anyone who above 18 years old should uh, should be tested or should be screened once in their lifetime. And then anyone that have high risk um, getting contracted or recontracted would have C. So those still continue using IV drugs. Um, those that men have sex with men, we recommend with yearly screening. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Hells, I wanted to ask in terms of uh, if you're a part, if you're listening to this conversation right now, and you're part of the vulnerable group, or you recognize some of those symptoms, or you know you have a history that that would make you part of the orbit, right? You say, okay, I think I need to get tested. What would be the steps to follow? Yeah. So um, primary care. Uh, so that's like your general uh, PCP. Um, they are able to order those tests for you. Um, it's an easy lab work, easy blood work, you know, drawn like any other lab um, it can be added on to other labs as well. Um, and so once primary care um, does that screening, they can they can tell you if you have hepatitis C or not um, and then um, can like help we can help connect you to care. We also have our hotline, um, which uh, if anybody has any questions um, about screening or you know how to access it or about treatment, we're always here to answer those calls. Somebody's always here Monday through Friday. If you leave a message on the weekend, we'll, we'll call you back on Monday. <laughs> okay. And that number is? Area code 928-263-HEP-C, H-E-P-C. And that is 928-263-4372. Dr. Williams, we talked about your collaborations with medical providers in the community. Can any provider refer a patient here to the disease management clinic? I love that question. Essentially, they could potentially. Okay. (laughs) They could potentially. And what that means is in the state of Arizona, there is a law pertaining to a collaborative relationship between the provider and the pharmacist. So... As long as the provider has a relationship with our clinic and our pharmacist, we're absolutely able to work together to provide that care. I know that we've been talking about the process of treating patients, and it's relatively simple. One thing I feel like we should address is what are the risks of reinfection? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. So with most of our patients that we're starting the treatments, we're only providing a thorough education for how to prevent reinfections. For instance, we only recommend patients to change any uh, personal items, anything that you think that um, the blood can go through. So like razor, to brushes, um, nail clipper, we only recommend them to change uh, those items when they start a treatment and when there is the first um result for um, the violos undetected, we also recommend them to change it again here and there periodically just to prevent the reinfections from their own blood. I additionally would would add that um, once we cure the hepatitis C, um, at that point, you know, it's completely gone from your blood. However, um, if you come in contact with hepatitis C again, you can get reinfected after that. So uh, once we cure you, you don't have any immunity to it moving forward. Um, So if you think that you might have had another exposure, uh, we recommend rescreening because you can't get it again. Kristen, we covered a lot of information in a short amount of time today. What are some of the key points we need to take home with us? The main thing that we want you to leave here with today is that if you are over the age of 18, you should ask your primary care doctor or nurse practitioner or physician assistant to screen you with the simple hepatitis C antibody test at least once in your lifetime. 
That number again for the Hep C hotline at KRMC's Disease Management Clinic is 928-263-4372. That's 263-4372. You've been listening to Kristen Nelson-Rowan. She's an RN and care coordinator here. Dr. Katie Halza, she's a doctor of pharmacy. Dr. Lily Wong, also a doctor of pharmacy. And Dr. Linda Williams, a doctor of pharmacy and pharmacy manager here. Ladies, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you. And that is the program. That's Focus on Your Health. I'm T.G. Lafredo. Thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you next time.